put into the drawer, the drawer is going to be redrawn. We will have to start in one hour from now. Well, that's a clip from the World Masters 12 months ago, would you believe? It seems uh, a hell of a lot longer, doesn't it, given everything that's happened uh, in society. Well, 12 months later, and given everything that we know about the BDO and everything that's happened in darts since then, I thought it'd be a good opportunity just to have a look at that rather chaotic afternoon at a Gray's Leisure Centre. Um, the most chaotic afternoon of Des Jacklin's tenure. It's actually always been on the bucket list to go to the World Masters uh, for myself, second oldest major in BDO darts. So when I found out that it was going to be uh, in Essex, I thought I'd take the day off and head down there. And just a very um, interesting tournament actually, because uh, globally, uh, there's just a lot of players that you don't normally see that go and participate in events like that, uh, which is always quite interesting guys like Christoph Wotowski and Gabriel Clements in previous years have done very, very well uh, at that event, so it's always nice to see uh, emerging talent. Um, but the afternoon, as I say, was not something that uh, I expected uh, and, and the way that it unravelled. And Martin Adams, uh, since then, has actually said and is quoted as saying that it's the day that the BDO died. So let's have a look at just what exactly went wrong. Well, uh, upon arrival, uh, things were pretty good actually, so uh, I was there with Alex Moss from the Weekly Darts Cast. There we are, very smiley in those halcyon days before uh, social distancing of course, uh, which we didn't know what it was at that point. And uh, yeah, just uh, you know, a good experience to uh, meet up and get some interviews for that particular podcast and it's available at theweeklydartscast.com. Uh, so I was milling around. Uh, there was a few uh, grumbles. Darts players do love a grumble, of course, as we know. Uh, it was very cl uh, very tightly packed. There weren't necessarily uh, as many practice boards as, as people would like and uh, possibly a bit cramped. But apart from that, it was going pretty well um, up until that point. So then we get up to one o'clock and this is where Des Chaglin actually takes to the stage and addresses the audience for the first time. There are still over and above people that have not turned up today. This means that the person that has turned up will get a bye in the first round and will not play until the second round. You will not know you get the bye until you go to the registration desk. For the first round, we need volunteer markers. Please, if you see an empty board and you know that you are not playing for a while, please get up and mark it. If you don't, it means that the day is going to run on even longer. If you see a spare board, please get up and mark it. Now, it's interesting that, isn't it? Because uh, you don't get the full clip there, and I'll explain the context. Uh, but he's talking now about volunteer markers uh, for the World Masters, which is just uh, absolute uh, madness, isn't it, really, to think that uh, you know, markers hadn't been um, assigned to boards, which is quite interesting, <laughs> quite interesting, uh, uh, given that everything that's synonymous with this uh, afternoon of darts in terms of the fake names and the redraw, you know, you just think, gosh, volunteer markers, I mean, if you've ever been to a local open, you don't see people rushing towards... Uh, doing volunteer marking in a hurry, do you? So yeah, that's uh, that was the first thing I thought, oh, that's very odd. Anyway, so in the week leading up to this, um, for uh, context, there was a few questions on social media, that, that common themes that kept running. One was the lack of a prize draw, and uh, so we didn't know what the prize fund was. Uh, more on that in a second. And the other part was the fact that there was a pre-draw done, and this was online, this was on their website, 
And uh, what was interesting was that it actually said best of seven legs throughout the tournament as opposed to set play. So one of the things that Zhe Xiangling did actually address in that early stage was that yes, it is set play and that was just a typo, so that's fair enough. The other thing he said was in relation to uh, tickets for the Circus Tavern because this was the floor stage, this was done at Gray's Leisure Centre and then it would be transferred to the Circus Tavern uh, later on in the week for the televised stages. And he announced that uh, uh, anyone that was playing and their supporters would get free tickets, uh, which you can look at one of two ways. One are, one being that uh, that's a fantastic thing uh, for uh, everyone and what a great way to support the event, or ticket sales haven't gone so well. Mm, you can debate that one, um, but it's probably, the answer may well be uh, in the middle of those two options, I, th I think. So that was about one o'clock. Now, I might have got my timing wrong here, but uh, it was around this point, it may have just been before he took to the stage or just after, that there was then this meeting with 16, with the 16 men's uh, seeds. Now, I wish I had a transcript for what, I, what was actually said uh, in that meeting. So everything I'm about to say is alleged, just one for the lawyers there. Um, but generally speaking, from hearsay and piecing it together from different accounts of, of players that were in that uh, room, it's uh, the, the rough, um, rough translation of what actually happened is as follows. So it's thought that the meeting was directed at trying to get the 16 seeds on side and trying to restore faith in what would have been quite a chaotic week up until that point. Um, one player is said to have wanted to record it, um, which was swiftly declined. Um, another player um, actually fired back at Jacqueline because um, Jacqueline was said to um, have basically been at breaking point and said it was a very high pressure situation and that he was going to quit. And to which another player, who is now in the PDC, is alleged to have fired back and said, well, we shouldn't have taken the job then, should you? And you think, well, yeah, quite. Um, the issue of money was raised by the players and the answer is alleged to have come back of well if you don't make the last 32 you don't need to know and at that point you just think gosh you know what what chance do we have here so the meeting happens there's then a delay we we're meant to start at around 2 30 or 2 2 o'clock 2 30 and then there's a delay and we think, well, what is the delay? What is actually happening? And then this is where we come on to the issue of fake names. And this is the uh, main bone of contention that is still debated now uh, as to what's always associated with the World Masters draw. So stay with me on this one because it's quite complicated. Um, but roughly, this is what the general thought and consensus is on social media, at least, or in the dance community that were following this event took place. So, more the, the facts of the matter are that there were more players there than there were in the draw, if that makes sense. So there were lots of players, there was a handful of players that had turned up for this event that were not in the pre-draw. This is why pre-draw is always a bit iffy, because if the registration process doesn't go to plan, then this is what happens. Players turn up and suddenly they're not in the event. This year, or last year rather, um, for this event, there was a new registration process that was clearly in place um, for governing bodies. This is what this is, you know, again alleged. And the governing bodies, for whatever reason, didn't register all the players that had actually qualified for the event for the World Masters, and that's why uh, they weren't in the draw. Then we come on to the issue of fake names. Now, a lot of people were doing research on the various names in the draw and were coming up with uh, no results. It was as if they didn't exist. So uh, it was the theory posited at this point is that there were fake names in the draw. And then so what you would do is you would simply take the players um, that weren't registered and then you would put them into the draw, uh, replacing the fake names. Is that Makes sense? Possibly not, understand. Um, slight problem with that, of course, there were more players there, um, the handful of players were not such a handful, um, and they actually, there were too many players to actually replace into the fake names. So, I ask you to pause at that point and think, well, what would you actually do? Would you turn away these players? I mean, obviously you wouldn't get yourself into this position in the first place, obviously, but, um, would you turn away those players and say, well, you didn't register properly, 
go away. Some of them have travelled possibly halfway across the world. Not a good look. Or do you then do the redraw? And I think most of us would probably go into the situation of doing the redraw, as tough as that is. Apparently this has happened in previous years, and I'll read out the statement from Des Jacqueline um, in a second, uh, just for balance and just for a bit more context. So, then we come to our second video, and this is the one that's synonymous and uh, did the rounds on social media, because Des Jacqueline, and you know, whatever you say about Des Jacqueline, he did get on stage and he did stand in front of a, basically a baying mob, and said this. Put into the draw, the draw is going to be redrawn. Oh We will have to start in one hour from now and you will not have assignment cards. It will be done on the microphone. The draw will be ready and up in about 30 minutes and you'll be called to the registration desk when your game is on. This is the only way for everybody in the room to be able to play the competition that they have qualified for. Quite the, uh, quite the moments. And one of the things about that video, looking back on it a year later, is that I remember at the time, I remember feeling that the room had basically just um, switched and turned on him. I remember the Northern Ireland contingents behind us, uh, or behind where I was filming that, they were going uh, mental. And what you've got to remember is, is that for, for a lot of these, um, you know, for a lot of the players in that room, um, you know, it's the biggest tournament of their lives, you know, or and certainly of the season and possibly of their lives. And it's a big deal. And, you know, for Northern Ireland, you know, for that Northern Ireland contingent, um, you know, they'd all come over together and it was it was a big team event and a, and a big day out and a Neil Duff who was part of that contingent played very well, uh, despite all the circumstances. Um, so yeah, you know, you can see why it's a crushing blow. And you know, is it any coincidence? And I don't think it is that Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Open, were the first ones to withdraw their uh, ranking points for the, for the BDO for their own tournament um, held in October every year. Um, well, I don't think it's a coincidence at all. I think that that experience that day certainly had had a big part to play in that. And also, you know, for, for, for myself, you know, the reason why I wanted to go to this event is to see local players, the likes of, you know, Francis Carragher and John Scott, you know, players that I've got to know at Riley's Victoria, events close to me. Um, you know, they tour all year and, you know, this is a big highlight for them. You know, it, it is a BDO major, you know, and then it's, a, a, you know, I also wanted to see the likes of you know, Aaron Turner, who's from Surrey, you know, and players like Steve Lovett, who had qualified, you know, he's also one of, you know, one of the best players that Surrey's ever produced, but doesn't tour, you know, here's a great opportunity for him to, to mix it and and, uh, and play with some of the best players around, you know, and, and this is a big day out for them. And it's just a crushing blow when it's organised, uh, you know, perhaps as badly as that. Now, that said, um, it's only fair that we read a statement from Des Jacqueline on this because uh, this is only one interpretation of the event. Alex Moss, who we saw earlier uh, in the video, he did uh, very well to get an interview with Des Jacqueline later on in the week. And in fairness to Des Jacqueline, he was very honest in, in his assessment of things. And here's a statement on, on what happened. I've heard there were fake names in the men's and ladies' drawers. There were people that had qualified for the events, then out of those people that had qualified for the events, there were people that had actually put their names in the drawer. There were people that put their names in for other people, and this was always going to happen. It's happened in the past every single year. But this year, because it's me, it's my name that's in charge and it's picked up on. I do think I did the wrong thing by announcing to everyone that it was wrong, and they were, we were going to have to redo it. I think in the past, people have stayed quiet, it's not been announced, and they've just got on with it and done a draw that's completely wrong. The people it would have affected were a handful of people, that handful would have been a bit verbal, and that would have been it. But by being up front and by saying, this is wrong and this needs to be done, it brought it to the forefront, then everybody wanted to have a pop. People want me to be upfront about it, and then when I am upfront about it, they tell me I'm not being upfront about it. The truth is what you get from me. If the truth isn't what's liked, then I don't win either way. As far as fake names go, I don't know anything about fake names. People put their name into the draw. I don't do it for them. 
I don't monitor the names that go into the draw. So that's a fairly comprehensive uh, statement from Des Jacklin. And as you saw in that video, one of the things that he did announce was that the draw would then be done on the microphone. Now, I'm not sure whether it actually was done on the microphone, but I, what I do remember is that the microphone was so tinny and dreadful, uh, and it wasn't of the, cl of the quality that, that, that Des Jacklin was speaking into, clearly it was a different microphone, um, that you couldn't actually hear anything that was being said, which was uh, particularly useful. I wish they just stood up and shouted it, really. That's a common theme of, of dance events, I find, that sometimes the microphones are just so absolutely appalling, it just drives you crazy. Um, and what I do remember, the binding memory, is that um, uh, uh, there was a lady who was actually giving the draw, and um, whenever there was a buy, and we'll come on to that in a second, uh, she would yell out, you've been exterminated at the top of her lungs, um, which wasn't the most professional, I would say. The redraw is done, and as you can see on this image here, you can see the players crowding around, no social distancing there, of course, uh, crowding around the notice board, trying to find the Darts of a Window printout to try and find out who on earth they're playing. So it's just a fairly mad scene, isn't it? Uh, which isn't great. Then, of course, we get on to uh, Danny Baggish and Matt Campbell and uh, Benjamin Pratinema. I hope I'm pronouncing uh, the Slovenian's name right there. Uh, now, these three players had qualified for um, Alexandra Palace at the PDC Worlds. And this picture here, which you can see from uh, Live Darts, another very good source of, of darts, um, is a contract which has suddenly appeared, which were basically... Um, you know, the BDO were attempting to force those players to sign, which would basically uh, waive the right of uh, attending the PDC Worlds and instead attend the BDO Worlds, which would take place at the O2, a new venue. Now, the BDO were largely ridiculed on, on social media for even attempting this. Um, as far as we know, they didn't sign uh, this contract, as far as we're aware. And in fairness, none of them uh, made the televised stages anyway of, of the World Masters. So we would never really have known uh, what would have happened had they actually come to, had to come to actually enforce this. Now, we do have a statement again from Tess Jacklin on this situation, and it's as follows. They told Alex Moss this at the weekly darts cast uh, at the conclusion of the event. They presumed they could play in this event. I explained that yes, they were legally allowed to play in our event, but we would not be allowing anyone who, had they won, had any intention of taking that spot and playing in our World Championship, especially in the new venue, the O2. So, in order for them to play in our event, I insisted they signed a contract which gave up the other entry, in, uh, other entry into the other event, that's the PDC Worlds. I don't think there was anything wrong with that. I think it was the right thing to do. What I didn't want to happen was somebody that wins the World Masters and then doesn't take that position and play in the O2. Now, that's an interesting point, actually, that he does, uh, that Des Jackson does raise there, because that's exactly what happened with Krzysztof Witowski. When he won the World Masters, he then didn't play uh, at Lakeside. He then ended up playing at the PDC Worlds at Ali Pali. So um, you can sort of understand where he's coming from there in the sense of you're trying to avoid that situation because everyone who saw Christoph Wojtowski win that and then not attend uh, Lakeside, you know, we all thought, oh, that's a bit odd, isn't it? Or, or I can, or maybe understandable, but not ideal. And so then, after all of that, the tournament then spluttered into life. And it did splutter because, again, as we came back, as the point that we were making earlier, there were no volunteer... Uh, markers, you know, as I said, unless you lace the palms of darts players with glorious five pound notes, and by the way, if you ever see me at a darts event and give me a fiver to chalk, I'm Eddie Bodies. Um, but, you know, the players, these matches, you know, were delayed in starting, you know, not by much, probably about 20 to 30 minutes, but matches were sort of finishing as others were starting, um, because there were no volunteer markers. And there was this wonderful moment where I was standing there next to uh, uh, Oki Balboa, Chris Hinton, uh, who we miss on, on Twitter very much. And I said, oh, I, 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 could, I could go and chalk and say I chalked at the World Masters. And Chris turned to me and said, not this one, not this one, Matthew. <laughs> Perhaps he had a point. 
And, uh, and then, yeah, so I got to see some dance. So here is a picture of uh, Dave Copley, who did very well, and he reached the last 32. Now, even after all of this had actually transpired, there were still players that somehow managed to make it through in the redraw that weren't there. So here's Dave Copley playing nobody. He was meant to be playing Barry Lynn. Well, Barry Lynn never registered, and he wasn't there in the venue at all at any point in the day. And yet, uh, you know, he was still drawn against him and it got a buy through to the next round because Barry Lynn wasn't there. He was exterminated as the, as the woman was very uh, gleefully shouting on the tinny microphone. Um, so there was that. I got to see a bit of uh, Paul Brown uh, there, pictured here. And then I got to see, I did get to see uh, Aaron Turner play. Um, which was good, he won his first round match. And then I got to see a bit of uh, Luke Ashtavisky and uh, Brian Roman, which was a very tight contest uh, as well. So I got to see a bit of darts, but then I had to, I had to go because I was only there for the afternoon. I uh, envisaged seeing uh, three hours of darts, but in reality probably only got the hour in the end. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a, a, a very strange experience. And as I got into the car, I th uh, it's back to normality. That's a picture of the uh, washing up there awaiting me when I was back. Um, I just thought, gosh, what, what have I seen? What have I seen? And 12 months later, I'm really not sure I, I can answer that question, really, even, even now. Just one of the most peculiar days of darts uh, I've ever experienced uh, before or since, and one to live long in the memory. Thank you very much for watching. Do leave a comment and do subscribe.